and welcome to Sasquatch Speaks. Today is Friday, August 30th, and this is a bonus episode. So if you're looking for a regular bonus, or excuse me, a regular episode with chitty chat and shenanigans and all that stuff, this won't be one. This is a bonus episode that I do thanks every month to Patreon and PayPal donations to the podcast. They're amazing. So send out good vibes as well right now. Thank you, Patreon, PayPal people. And we'll get on with it. So this month I'm going to do a little bit of a spinning bonus episode. I've done the podcast for so long now, I th five, six years, something like that. I sometimes, you know, I feel like I, I repeat myself quite a bit, but sometimes I don't go into the longer things, like how I started spinning, you know, all those kinds of things um, during a regular episode that I normally, that I probably did the first time around, like the first time I was talking about spinning on the podcast. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about how I started spinning, why I started spinning, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the wheels that I currently own and some books that I like as well. So if you're not interested in spinning, but I felt like a good time to do this because fall feels like, to me, fall feels like festival spinning weather. Like even though this fleece are sh or the fleece, the sheep are shorn in the springtime usually, um, it's just... That fall winter hunkering down vibe is to me feels a lot like a spinning vibe. Um, I'm also kind of hoping to like re-motivate myself to get back into my spinning a bit more uh, by talking about why I started to do it in the first place. Okay so how did I get started spinning? Um, I actually originally had no interest in spinning. I taught myself to knit before I was a freshman first year in college um, and then I didn't I knit pretty heavily in college like I knit a lot, okay. And then I kind of just like petered out after that. I never had a stash. Like all of my stash would fit in like one of those flat Rubbermaid under the bed boxes and not a big one, a little one. Um, I was always just like a one project at a time kind of person. So I don't even know that I realized spinning was a thing that like people did that I, I don't think that was even in my environment in my head. I do remember though when I was in college we did some like charity knit mitten knitting and one of the skeins in like the Smith Stitchers I don't remember what we were called. I think we were were we called the knitwits? I don't remember. I don't remember. But they had like a group yarn stash that like folks had donated over time that we could use for this and one of the skeins was this golden yellow not my favorite color then, but now totally one of my favorite colors. And I didn't know what was different about that yarn. I knew that it was different. I knew that I really loved the texture of it and I was really intrigued by it. And then of course later I realized that that had been hand spun and I just didn't even know what that was at the time. Sorry, my dog is like doing crazy things in my peripheral and it's a little distracting because he might also be eating the entire house. So I do occasionally just have to check to make sure that that's not what's happening. Anyway. I didn't, I don't think I even understood that, that spinning was a thing. And then when I did find out that spinning was a thing, I was like, why would I do that? Like there's so much cool yarn in the world. Why would I actually try to make that yarn? Like that yarn is amazing and there's all the different kinds and like it's you know crazy and cool and great. And, and at that time too, like definitely again, I was like a, I was a person who only had one hat because I was like, I only have one head. so foolish. <laughs> That's the kind of knitter I was. I was a practical knitter and, and hand sponges did not even compute to me. Fast forward, I get laid off from my like nine to five job um, when my kiddo was like three-ish and I got into knitting podcasts and I don't even really know how that happened. I don't know if I was just looking for something and I found the Knit Girls. And so then through the Knit Girls, I started to think about maybe spinning and maybe that would be something I was interested in. And then suddenly I found this book, the Fleece and Fiber Source book. And I don't recall if it was through them. It must have been because I actually went to see when I purchased this uh, and I did not purchase it through Amazon, which is surprising to me, but I don't know where I got it. I don't know if I got it in person somewhere, whatever. This was... The, this was the clincher. This was the, oh, now I'm 100% into spinning. 
So I was editing the podcast and through editing and listening to myself recount the narrative of like the order of events that led me to spinning, it occurred to me that that is actually not what happened. <laughs> Somehow I ended up with the Fleas and Fiber Source book. I may have actually purchased it at a bookstore, like a Barnes and Noble Borders, what have you. And then from that, I decided that I needed to learn to spin. And then from that, I was looking for spinning videos and Laura and Leslie of the Knit Girls had a spinning video. I could not tell you which one it was. And then that is the first time I ever saw a knitting podcast. So I'm 99.9% confident that that is the actual narrative that happened. So I feel like I just need to correct it. <laughs> um, and what this is, this is the Fleece and Fiber source book um, by Deborah Robson and Carol Icarius. I apologize. And really what it is, is just, it's just spinner's porn. It is just about all of the different sheep. They talk about the history of the breed, what the breed is used for today. And then of course you have all of these amazing samples of washed locks, of combed locks, of spun yarn. Lots of times they'll offer it in different spinning, like they'll have a worsted and a woolen spun, you know, option to show you the difference. And this book got me because I was super into this concept of having yarn where I could identify where the sheep like what the sheep was and yes there were breed specific yarns at that time but they were very pricey they were definitely outside of my comfort zone which has increased since then <laughs> So then how did I decide to get a wheel? Um, I had spun on a drop spindle. It was a pretty basic beginner's model drop spindle. And I had done park and draft and I felt like, okay, I kind of get this. I feel like it's probably something I could do. I did not feel in any way like I had even come close to being even comfortable with a drop spindle before I decided to get a wheel because, you know, this book, right? Like I knew that I wanted to be able to do this stuff. So. I decided to check out Craigslist and I found a couple of fellas who were just like five miles down the road from me who were selling an Ashford Traditional and a Louette S10. And I had never touched a wheel. I had never treadled a wheel. I had no idea about anything about a wheel. Um, but I decided to go with the Louette because it had a bigger bobbin, which was more interesting to me than the Ashford tra Traditional has a smaller bobbin. It also had a slightly smaller footprint, which made sense to me uh, because the Louette is like an upright wheel versus the Ashford Traditional, which takes up a little bit more floor space. So I brought it home, watched a lot of YouTube videos, cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed some more um, until I pretty much figured it out. I know that I at one point got an interweave like downloadable video, but I tried to figure out which one that was and I just couldn't remember. It's been a long time, yo. But between that and YouTube videos, I taught myself to spin, which was really exciting. Um, and then I spun on that wheel for quite some time until eventually I decided to go ahead and purchase a shocked ladybug. And the main reason I decided to move on from the Louette S10 is the Louette has what's called Irish tension. And it means that, well, I don't want to get into the mechanics of a wheel, but Irish tension has a tendency to have a much stronger pull on. So when the yarn is pulled onto the bobbin of the, mach of the machine, it, it has a greater force exerted on the yarn. And because of that, at my skill level at the time, I wasn't able to get a finer yarn. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't get super lace weight, beautiful amazingness out of Louettes because they can. But at again, at my, my combination of my skill level, how I spin all kind of came together to make that really just too much of a challenge to me in the moment. So I decided to move on to a scotch tension, double drive, what have you, um, to see if that would help me expand my abilities. And it did. Um, and that's not to say that the Louette, oh, and also the Louette is a single, the one I have is a single treadle. Um, and so it just, it just has a different feel to it. It's a little bit more like this than a double treadle. Um, and again, maybe that was just my skill level at the time, my coordination at the time. Um, but 
I did move on to a shocked ladybug. I had never tried one. I had never touched one. I just kind of decided that that would be good. <laughs> I just took a risk. And I'm very pleased with it. It's my wheel that I use the most now. I feel like of what I have, it's the most versatile. It's, I aesthetically like it. Um, and I just enjoy that wheel the most of the wheels that I have. Now, that does not mean I do not, she's over there, I don't, doesn't mean I do not lust after other wheels because I do. Like I would love a Maja Craft Rose, but I live in a relative, a smaller house. So I just don't have, and don't tell me about ways to get around the floor space issue, please. Shush. <laughs> I know we could like store them on wall shelves and what have you, but like, let's just be reasonable. Be reasonable. So I have it. I use it a lot. I had at one point an injury um, on my, I ultimately had, I found out that I had a bursa in my heel, but that was not until later. I originally just had self-diagnosed with, um, some, what I felt like was pretty painful, um, plantar fasciitis kind of thing. That's not ultimately what it was, but that's not it. And it just never seemed to go away. And it did feel like it was aggravated when I used the treadling. So I thought, well, and Hanson had relatively recently, not like super recently, but relatively recently introduced their mini spinner. And so I decided, and that's what this one is. I'll show you, I'm not showing the ladybug because it's giant, it doesn't even fit the frame. Um, so I decided to go with that. I had heard a lot of people really love that they could, they felt like this was a little bit more flexible for them. For example, some folks can sit on their recliner, put this between their feet and spin, um, you know, while they're watching TV. And I'm always interested in, um, being able to integrate these crafts into like everyday activities that I might share with my partner or my kid or what have you. I, that's the reason I've really never gotten into quilting. Like even though I sew for a business, I've never enjoyed it for leisure because it feels like it's just separating me from other folks too much, which is interesting because usually I really like to be separated from other folks, but you know what I mean? Okay. okay. So I purchased this. I do like my Hanson quite a bit. Um, I still don't find it to be as, for me, as versatile as a ladybug. Um, and I think that there's a couple of reasons that that's specific to me. Um, for one thing, I tend to do a sort of like semi-woolen spinning. So woolen versus worsted spinning, there's lots of different things that contribute to those styles. There's how the fiber is prepared. There's how you move your hands. But the way I move my hands tends to be a slightly more woolen approach and because of just like my own technique and how I've learned to spin I tend to move my fiber arm so the, the arm that I hold my fiber in I tend to move it be, uh, behind my torso so I move it beyond behind my midline which means that I don't ever really feel comfortable spinning in a comfy chair like I almost I'm sure that I do 99% of my spinning in a kitchen chair where the back is narrower than my back so I can move this arm. Now I have done some worsted spinning. I do want to be better at worsted spinning just for skill's sake. Um, but my default spinning, the spinning that I feel the most comfortable with is that technique where I'm moving my arm behind my torso. And that means that sitting in a recliner doesn't work for me with the, the hands in. Um, so it's not that, but at the same time, it did let me do a lot of spinning when I had this pain in my heel and I'm very appreciative for it. Um, and also when I've had back issues, you know, if I go to a worsted spin, I can spin on this if I can't sit actually more the the kitchen chair thing is more hips and back, but you know what I mean? Like if I'm having some sort of issue, um, this does give me physically a little bit more versatility than ladybug. Now that's not to say lots of folks can sit in a regular like living room chair and and spin it on their treadle wheels. Um, I've seen lots of folks do it. I've seen lots of people sit on couches and do it. Uh, for my specific ergonomic self, it doesn't feel good to me. Um, but that's definitely a personal thing. So. so yeah, those are the wheels I have. I recommend um, all of them, except the Louette, I will be honest. I just don't recommend, I mean, it's like, if it's like your first wheel and you got a chance to try it out for $150, then I think that's because 
you know, that was where I was. And that was a great way for me to start. And in fact, I'm really glad I learned to spin on the Luet S10. I think it's what made me into a sort of semi woolen spinner. Um, and I, this is just a theory. But because that Irish tension pulls so hard, even you could, there's lots of things you could do to decrease the pull, but because it has such a strong uptake, a strong pull on the yarn, I think that's the reason I started drafting more of a slightly woolen style because to pinch, so when you're spinning worsted, again, there's lots of factors, but this is one of them. When you're spinning worsted, you're keeping your twist away from your fiber until you've kind of got your fiber lined up and then you can let the twist in, okay? So it's like you're kind of like drafting or figuring out what the, the pre-yarn is going to be before you let the twist into that section, okay? So that means typically you have to pinch these fingers firmly enough that the twist is held away from your, your fiber, okay? Because the Louette pulled so hard, I think that that's one of the reasons I did not feel comfortable doing a worsted spin because it just was physically challenging for me to keep enough pressure here to keep the spin out of my fiber and yet also not let the machine, because the machine's pulling the yarn away from me. It was a lot of factors, but I think that's why that I ultimately decided, or, or decided, I didn't decide. <laughs> my body decided that I was going to be a person who let that twist kind of work into the the fiber as I was drafting out the fiber, like letting them kind of work together um, versus pushing back the twist. Which is interesting because usually I'm a super controlling person, which tends to manifest itself in more worsted spinners. Um, but I don't know. I guess it just went against, it was in, it worked. I physically just, and I still physically feel like worsted spinning feels too, like, physically rigid to me. Um, but, again, that's just me. It's not anybody else. <laughs> it is something I want to work on um, just so I have more versatility. Because sometimes there, you want that yarn that you produce from worsted spinning. Um, and I would like to be better at achieving that. And I'm not great right now. I mean, I'm not great at spinning any yarn, quite frankly. Like, I'm just not. <laughs> I enjoy spinning. I am definitely not a technical spinner. I don't count how many um, twists are in an inch. I don't, you know, I might have a plan for the yarn before I start, but I'm going to just tell myself, like, I would like it to do this, but it probably won't. And that tends to make me happier in my spinning. Um, but, you know, that's just... Oh, I forgot that was even... What is this? Oh, look at me finding things. Hmm, that's fun. <laughs> so, here's just some spinning. Um, whoop. So, you can see, like, I these are not perfectly twisted. They're not perfectly even. Like, this is a good example. There's some twisty, fluffy parts and some firmer twist parts. And ultimately, that's okay with me. I'm kind of okay with that. I think that, and I think the reason I am okay with it is because if I want it to be perfect, I can get a commercial yarn that looks like that. And like, I ha so I can get access to that. Um, but this is the way I get access to things that aren't commercial, that aren't perfect. So I enjoy it. I, of course, I think like most hand spinners, I always want to spin, knit more with my hand spin. Um, I'm just like, oh, I'm really enjoying this one. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons I've kind of changed over from, uh, not consistently, but I try to do fewer single bump skeins and try to do more double bumps, like so that it's an eight ounce skein instead of a four ounce skein. Um, it just makes it easier to kind of stretch a little bit further unless you're doing a hat or, you know, something it's like this one is a double bump. And also I never spin very fine. So it's always good to have a little bit of extra yardage. <laughs> I still don't spin very wet yarn, like ever, very rarely. But my default tends to be like a DK. Hmm, whatever, I'm okay with it. 
I like that it's always there. Like it's always something I can work on, but it's, not, it's never anything I have to work on. Do you know what I mean? Like it's something I want to grow and get better at, but if I don't, that's also okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So that's a little bit about wheels. It's about, um, I think what I'll do is maybe do a whole episode on like kind of fiber prep, like in terms of like fleece to yarn, kind of like that end of the spinning. Um, because I do have an interest in that as well, but it is a lot of information. So I'll probably do that at another time. Um, but just to tell you, if, talk about, if you, I'm hiding the yarn because Gus wants to tear it up. So badly. I don't have very many spinning books. It didn't occur to me to look in here. I do have like a totally vintage one in here, but whatever. I'll just talk about the ones I did find, um, and why I like them and why I purchased them. So of course I love the, f this, the one I talked about, the fleece and fiber source book. It is the one spinning book that I would never, de like I would never get rid of because A, it's nostalgic because it was what I, but, but B, I just find it endlessly fascinating. And I love to look up different breeds that I've found and, or just history of breeds that I am thought I was familiar with, but aren't. I just, it's so cool. Like, I love that we are invested and involved in this craft where there is just always more to learn. It's so exciting. I mean, I know that that's true with a lot of, of hobbies and skills, but it just, I just really dig it. But so I have that one. I also have this one. This is the field guide to fleece. Um, same authors, Deborah Robson and Carol Eckeris. Acarius. Um, and it's basically just a very abridged version of that information. It's organized differently. This, uh, the, the original is organized by, um, like group. So you'll have a feral group, you'll have a meat group, you'll have, um, a Welsh hill and mountain family. Um, you know, so it's a little bit, it's more challenging to find the specific sheep in terms of like, for quick reference, you do have to consult an index. I mean, it's not hard. It's just a consult an index. But this one is organized specifically alphabetically by the breed. And again, I'm sure that's because this is like a take it with you kind of thing where theoretically you would take this with you to a fleece sale and you could very quickly familiarize yourself with the breed of sheep that you're interested in. It sells a lot of the same information. You're still going to get a little blip about history or origins. Um, it gives you a little bit of information about the dye, how dye takes, and then it gives you like your, your strictly like factual origin, fleece weight, staple links, fiber down, natural colors, and then it has a little place for you to put notes as well. So, and it gives you a sample lock. It's not going to give you your sample yarns, but it's going to give you a sample lock of that breed. So I like this one. I do not consult it very often and theoretically I could take it with me, but I don't think I ever. So I guess of my four spinning books that I have five, this would be the first one I would get rid of. Um, but it's still cool and fun. And then kind of like as a transition between fleece and yarn, there's this book, which is called The Spinner's Book of Fleece um, by Beth Smith. And it has a, de a foreword by Deborah, Deborah Robson. Um, and it's a breed by breed guide for choosing and spinning the first, the perfect fiber for every purpose. So. This is still, this is still like, okay, you like to spin, but you're interested in the sheep part. Okay. So this is not like I only buy commercial top or even prepared uh, roving. This is like the in-between though of the just straight up learning about the fiber versus um, learning more about the yarn. So this one has fewer breeds, so it's less exhaustive but it has more information about what your yarn um, is going to do. It has more information about ways to prepare the yarn. So they talk about actually how to comb yarn. They talk about how to card yarn. They talk about how to remove the yarn, the fiber from the combs to create a combed top. They talk about what drum carding is and it's never like exhaustive. Like, um, they talk about how to use hand cards and they talk about curved back versus flat back. Um, so yeah. And they talk about that for each kind of wool, like the downy breeds versus 
the long wool breeds. That's not true. I just made that part up. They don't talk about that for each of them. <laughs> I'm a liar and I lie. You should never trust me. Um, they talk a little bit about weaving. <clears throat> but so anyway, so this is a great, again, in-between resource. The dog is insane. And then two more books. Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs, Techniques for Creating 80 Yarns by Sarah Anderson. So this yarn has literally, like, it's a, like, here are two, here are different yarns that you might want to learn how to use. This is how to do hauser plying. Why you might want to do each of those, like how you would make a wool boucle, and how you might decide to do bubble crepe. You know, so it's a lot of different techniques. And you can see there's not a huge discussion of the technique. To me, it's more like, I use it more as like, oh, these are the these are potentially the things that I could do with yarn or that I could do with my wool, my hand spun. I I'm gonna kind of like get into that. Like this is my first exposure to, oh, I can make a mohair with a hand spun core and binder. And this is gonna kind of get me interested. Show me some examples of like my S versus my Z twists and things like that. But it's more of like an entry way and then I might go find out more. Um, to me, that is more what it is. Um, but it has these really groovy little cards in the back so that you have like reference, which I think is, I'm a sucker, quite frankly, sucker. A for vellum envelopes, I'm on board 100%. And the B, you have these little perforated cards. Now, there's one that's referenced that has like S versus Z twist, but it also talks that like there's just different like shortcut cards to kind of get you into a quick reference of what you might be interested in doing with yarn. Excuse me, with fiber. Excuse me. So that's a spinner's book of yarn designs. I'm not even showing it to you closely. <laughs> and so then the last book I'll talk about for me on the spectrum, is yarn a texture. So this is a great, and this is by Jillian Marino, who by the way, is a wonderful human being, and I enjoy her muchly. I took a class with her that I really enjoyed, and also she is just cute as a button, okay? And I say that in like a respectful lady way. I don't mean it in a dismissive way. I just mean like, you are super rad, and you're also just like energetic and bubbly and fun. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> so this is the book I would probably recommend if you're like, I think this is a book I would recommend if you're into learning, to, if you're into spinning, but you're not into like the, the sheep. Like you're just like, that's nice, but no thank you. I'm only going to buy comb dyed top. I'm just not into all that realness of the sheep. <laughs> And like, this is also for you. This book is also for you. But I ultimately just don't reference it that much because that's just not my spinning jam is not to try different yarns so much. I think it's great for weavers. I think it's great for everybody, but it's just not my bend in the road. This one, however, is a good kind of like broad reference book because it goes everywhere from basic sheep breed information, basic fiber information. So it talks about camelids, it talks about silks, it talks about, um, what are those artificial things? <laughs> Synthetics, that's probably the word. So the section on that has a section on fiber preparation, and then it has, um, then it goes into, it's really, she's kind of set it up as like a, a house, right? Like the blueprint is the idea of what you want to do. The foundation is like the actual fiber that you're using. The frame is their fr your preparation of the fiber. The walls is all about drafting. Then she goes into plying, finishing, color, knitting with your hand spun. And then there's lots of patterns to use with your hand spun. So I think this is a pretty good reference book um, for the actual spinning itself, for what most spinners are going to be going for. So if you're not interested in really, like, I, I mean, I like knowing how to core spin theoretically. I know, I know how to do a boucle, but I, I really just don't find myself wanting to make those things 
So this for me is a more useful resource. Does that make sense? I hope it does. And she does talk about some technical stuff. Like it has technical information about like what's grist, what's twist, um, you know, how do you measure twist? And it has, so it has those, those wheel, those nuts and bolts in it as well. So I think it's a good, a very good resource. So in my personal life, the books I would say from the fire go from fleece and fiber, yarn and texture, spinner's book of fleece, spinner's book of yarn designs, and then a guide, field guide for the fleece. That's what I would save in order. After everything else, you know what I mean. I'm just trying to give you an idea. So anyway, I hope that was helpful um, in terms of like maybe getting some inspiration. Um, I just want to make sure that there was nothing else. Yeah, that's cool. That's everything I wanted to say. Um, just, you know, again, if you find yourself kind of interested, I do really like it. Negatives about spinning. It is a dollar sinkhole. Like you think, I think part of the reason I kind of thought, oh, I could do spinning is because you look at um, your natural fibers and their p cost per pound. Um, and lots of times you can get a natural fiber that's um, prepared and ready to spin for like $15 a pound. That's not even that crazy. And so part of me as a fat knitter was like, hmm, that's like $25 for a sweater. And like there was a value kind of uh, niggle that made me interested like, hmm, that does seem like a value. But in reality, unless you are very good <laughs> at budgeting and not being distracted by shiny things, it is a dollar sinkhole. Um, the initial startup price for a wheel is just about whatever you want it to be in terms of like shopping for stuff on Craigslist that's used. Um, you can buy older wheels and re-finish um, them. I don't recommend that for a new person unless you're just specifically into that thing. Uh, but usually when you just don't know how a wheel works anyway or how it's supposed to feel, it's pretty challenging to go in um, without any sort of like baseline comparison when you're working on a vintage or um, a reconstructed wheel. That's not the right word, but you know what I meant. Refinished. Um, where we're going with this. <laughs> um, oh, money sinkhole. Yes. So yes, if you stick with those like natural fibers that are prepared, um, that aren't hand dyed, you know, you can really get into a place where you're making a very good value yarn for yourself. That's still cool. It adds extra value to the pro meaning like like I always kind of compare knitting to movies in terms of like price. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm like, okay, it costs us $25 like minimum to go see a two hour movie as a family. So then I kind of like base all entertainment off of that. Like, is it cheaper than a movie? Is it more expensive than a movie? And so the same thing with knitting. Like if you knit a lace weight, anything, you're getting more value, like more entertainment, more hobby value from that because the project just costs less unless, you know, you know, you're using like the fanciest hand dyed skein of lace, but you know what I mean? Like yarn by yarn comparison, like your lace project is going to last longer. It's going to take you longer and cost you less than a chunky weight project will. It's the same thing with spinning. You know, if you go and you spin all of your yarn, you get all of that value out of it. And then you also get to knit it. So even though if you buy a hand dyed, fiber that costs $20 for a four ounce bump, you're actually still getting more like entertainment out of it than you would if you bought a skein of yarn that was $20 for a four ounce skein. Because you have the added enjoyment of spinning it. That can go the other way though, where you maybe don't get what you're really going for. And so now you're like, oh, now I have this $20 <laughs> skein of yarn that I thought I was going to use for this thing, but I can't. So now I still have to make this thing with something else. And so then that's the way it can kind of glom on and be a money pit. But real for reals, like it can go, just like knitting, it can go either way. It can go either way. You can make it what you want to make it. 
<sighs> I think that's enough. <laughs> Anyway, I hope you have a great holiday weekend coming up and I'll talk to you next time.